Hello, everybody, and welcome to Monday Night Travel with Rick Steves Europe. My name is Gabe Gunning, and I have the privilege of joining you all as your moderator this evening as we explore Europe's most commanding castles and pristine palaces along with Rick tonight. Now, without further ado, I would like to turn things over to our friend and tour guide for this evening, Rick Steves. Rick, over to you. Thank you, Gabe, for that great introduction. And uh, everybody can sit back and relax. I'm going to do the same thing. I've got myself a good German beer. That is a Spatenbrau. And when I look at that, it reminds me of when I'm in Munich because there are beloved brows, different kinds of breweries, and each one has a big beer hall, a big beer garden. And different people in Munich have different favorite beer gardens, and that's the place they go. You know, I think Spatenbrau is a, a beloved one. Uh, of course, Hofbrau, there you see Hofbrau, and that's the most famous one for the tourists. And each of them will have a big tent at Oktoberfest. Hmm. But I'm just ready for Monday night travel. Thanks for being with us. And this is our weekly chance to get together and enthuse about travel. As you know, when I'm in a normal year, I'm in Europe right now. I spend 100 days in Europe. I'm going to do that next year. I've done it for more than 30 years up until COVID hit. And now we've had a couple of seasons where we're just staying home and we're stoking our travel dreams and we're making sure that this pandemic can derail our planes, trains and our plans, but it cannot derail our dreams. And we are going to be traveling again really soon. And what I like to do on Monday night is to stoke your travel dreams and to remind you of some of the great places in Europe. So thanks for being with us today. The theme is castles and palaces. And I thought it would make sense to have some good Good German food. So I've got um, some Spätzle, and Spätzle is the uh, German sort of um, chewy egg pasta. Mm. And that goes with the sauerkraut and with the Wurst and with wonderful mustard. Uh, this is about the ugliest plate I've ever held up on Monday Night Travel, but I would say it's one of the tastiest also. So this is a beautiful beer hall kind of meal. We've also got pumpernickel, and pumpernickel goes well with liverwurst liver sausage and pumpernickel. And if you think liverwurst smells funny, pumpernickel is the old German word, I believe, for the devil's fart. This is one powerful little sandwich. It's usually served in an open face kind of way like this with beautiful mustard. And we've got some sauerkraut. Mm. So if we're going to be talking more about that later, I'm going to be dipping my pretzel into some good mustard. And I'm going to be enjoying my beer most importantly, I'm going to be enjoying taking you around. So make yourself at home. I hope you feel comfortable. Every uh, Monday afternoon, I get all ready. It feels like I have a couple of thousand people busting into my house, ready to talk travel. And we're going to go right now. And like we do every week, I want to take you to our website at ricksteves.com. And at ricksteves.com, you can check in with what's going on. All of our TV shows, our radio shows, our guidebooks, our tours, Tours are the big news lately. We just opened up our tour program about a month ago, and we've sold 80% of our tours for 2022. We're not doing any tours in 2021, but we're confident there'll be good tours going on next year, and we've got a chance there. You can dive in and see how the tours are going. You just uh, click on Browse Our Small Group Tours, and there you can see all the different tours and you know, plug into, oh, there's the heart of Italy in nine days. And you can go there and see, ah, there's still seats open on that tour. And you are welcome to grab it in before all of them have joined the wait list. So lots of tour action going on. What I want to do right now is to remind you that we're going to go down to Classroom Europe. And Classroom Europe is a tool we made for school teachers so they can take their kids around Europe. It's free, it's fun, anybody can enjoy this. If you go to ricksteves.com and check out Classroom Europe, you've got 500 little um, you know, searchable clips. And what we're going to do right now is put one together, a little show of our own. I'm going to click here on themes. And uh, the theme for today will be castles. And I click there and I get 19, just quick as can be. And I can click here on uh, whatever really tickles my fancy. And we'll have a show. We're going to go to Brenner Pass and check out one of my favorite castles in Northern Italy. Uh, boy, there's so many we could check out. I think we're going to go to Warwick Castle in England. That is just the classic English castle. Let's go to Romania and check out Dracula's Castle. 
And how about the White Cliffs of Dover, where you've had 2,000 years of English fortifications to protect Britain from bad guys on the continent. Let's go to the Loire Valley in France and check out some of its amazing chateau. The Gibraltar of the North would be in Helsinki. Sumon Lina will go there. So many castles. The greatest medieval walled fortress city in all of Europe is Carcassonne. I want to take you there in France. And let's see what that does. If we look up here, we've got seven videos, 31 minutes. So. I can now go to my playlist that I've built by clicking those. And here's what we got. And I can organize it. I think I want to start off with Romania and Dracula's castle. And then we give it a name. So I'm just going to call this Monday Night Travel Castle Fun. And you could put in whatever instructions you wanted to give to your travel partners or whatever. And then click Save to your list. Anybody, this is free. Anybody can do this just like I am. I've got my own personal list of, of um, uh, playlists and you can have your archive also. And here's what I just saved, Castle Fun. Seven videos, 31 minutes. So that is Classroom Europe. And that's what we would like to encourage teachers and travelers to use so they can get the most out of the um, amazing work my TV crew has done over the years to collect all these great sites. We're gonna start right now. We're gonna head off to Europe, but I wanna, before we go to our first castle, I would like to play a game that we play. It's called Where's Rick? And this is the teases. The teases are the opening of our show where I say, and I'm Rick Steves back with more of the best of Europe. This time we're doing this, that, and that because we are in, and then there's all sorts of excitement. Bam, we say where it is. That's the tease. This is a collection of five teases, the way we kicked off five shows, and it's a little test. Can you guess where we are? It's a drinking game. If you get it wrong, you got to take a drink. If you get it right, mm, take a drink also. We're going to be partying Monday night travel style. So I'm going to take you right now to this Where's Rick collection of teases, and thank you for joining us this week. Here we go. Hi, I'm Rick Steves, back with more of the best of Europe. This time, we're soaking in the cultural wonders of... Where could that be? Famous for its mineral spas and where the guys stuff into their little tiny swimming suits and play chess. Hungary, in Budapest. <laughs> Checkmate, all right. Hi, I'm Rick Steves, back with more of the best of Europe. This time we're tasting, pedaling, and cruising our way through Scandinavia's most fun-loving capital. Scandinavia's most fun-loving capital, Oslo, Stockholm, I think the most fun-loving capital, much as I would like to say Oslo because I'm Norwegian, it is Copenhagen. Hi, I'm Rick Steves. For many travelers, the quintessence of Spain is found here. Oh, baby. There, we're talking castles, we're talking palaces. This is the Moorish Palace, the capital of the Moors for centuries in the south of Spain. What city is that? Andalusia. The sounds, sights, and experiences of southern Spain are shaped by waves of history. Join us as we enjoy the food, music, dance, and art of perhaps Europe's most passionate corner, Andalusia. And that specifically was Granada. Merhaba, I'm Rick Steves, back with more travels. This time, we're living the good life. Backgammon, a nice glass of Rocky, and the sparkling Mediterranean. It's the best. Okay, Merhaba, what language would that be? Rocky, that's not Uzo, so it's not Greece. And backgammon, it's called Shishbish, 5-6 in much of this country. I just love this moment. We are in of Western Turkey. Thanks for joining us. Hi, I'm Rick Steves, back with more of the best of Europe. This time, I'm surrounded by Slavic culture. It's... Ooh, Slavic culture. This could be one of four or five different countries that I can think of off the top of my head. The Slavic dancing, the Slavic musical instruments. Where could we be? Underrated country. Bulgaria. Thanks for joining us. All right, so now we're going to go to Romania. We're going to kick things off by leaving the capital of Bucharest, 
right off the bat, we see some poppies. You got to stop when you see poppies and go out there and flip through those. And then we're going to go to a castle that rivals Mad Ludwig's castle in Bavaria in the Transylvanian Alps. Stunning fields of poppies are irresistible. And this quick roadside stop is just too joyful to pass up. Our next stop is Pelish Castle, the summer residence of Romania's first king, Carol. Carol chose a mountainous and forested setting that reminded him of his German homeland. And he imported German architects to create this fanciful hunting lodge. Prickly with over-the-top spires, Pelish ranks among Europe's finest Romantic Age palaces. So I got to remind you, Romantic Age, that means the late 1800s. And a lot of this stuff looks over-the-top medieval. And the pointiest stuff, look how pointy that is. It's generally neo-medieval, uber-medieval. Mad Ludwig's castle, the same generation as this castle right here, Romantic. And it boasts one of the most dazzling late 19th century interiors anywhere. The Hall of Honor, with its red carpets, grand staircase, and venerable portraits, sets the tone. The woodwork is exquisite. The rest of the rooms have a grand, yet somehow cozy, elegance. Glittering crystal chandeliers, thoughtful touches, King Carol ruled for 48 years. When summering at the palace, he took care of matters of state in his study. Mm -hmm. For over 30 years, the king dined with guests here. His impressive collection of weapons and armor stoked conversation. The library showed off the king's passion for education. And today, more than a century later, Tourists from around the world still marvel at King Carol's Castle. Just over the Carpathian Mountains, we cross into the fabled region of Transylvania. Transylvania. It means across the forest, and that's literally where we've gone. We're spending the night in the handy home base town of Brajov, which fills a scenic mountain valley. Most of the city's people live in boxy communist era apartment blocks many of which have been spiffed up. But the historic old town is much more charming. It's packed with locals enjoying a balmy evening. Thriving and appealing, Brajov offers a glimpse into a mid-sized Romanian city that has its act together. You know, think about that, this Brajov. I, I had never heard of Brajov until I got there. It's a delightful town. And there's no tourists, at least no tourists that I could recognize. I was probably local tourists, but my goodness, there are some beautiful places hiding in Europe. Romania is filled with surprises. Among other things, Transylvania is well known for its rustic and wild countryside and a medieval history with a surprising German twist. In the 12th century, Transylvania's Hungarian overlords needed help taming this wild frontier. So they imported skilled merchants and hardworking settlers from the German lands. For that reason, you'll find German-speaking enclaves and delightful German towns in this part of Romania. One of Transylvania's seven original German towns is Sigishora, perhaps the most popular tourist town in all of Romania. The old center is entirely contained within its fortified hilltop. Several of Sigishora's watchtowers still survive, and its historic centerpiece is its clock tower. So I just finished my Spatenbrau, and it occurred to me, I'm pouring a German beer while watching Romania, but everything we've seen so far has had a German connection. You know, the, the, the prince at Pelish, he was a German guy. Uh, this town, it was a German-speaking enclave in so many ways. I, saw, I, I noticed this when I was traveling there back in communist times when I was a teenager. And I noticed it when I was just there a couple of years ago filming. In so many ways, the traditional Germany that we hope to see in Germany, you can see it better in these German-speaking enclaves in Romania. Proudly trumpeting the town's special status in the Middle Ages. Within the town's protective walls, visitors explore cobbled lanes, enjoy pastel German-style facades, and 
sip beers on the main square. Nearby, a statue honors the town's tenuous connection with an infamous Romanian prince, Vlad Tsepish. In the 15th century, he ruthlessly fought the Turkish Ottomans. Much later, he became better known as the inspiration for a vampire. Vlad had two nicknames, Vlad the Impaler and Dracula. That means son of the devil. Vlad the Impaler was brutal in his defense of his homeland. While he didn't drink anyone's blood, he was sadistic, famously impaling his victims. The popular Dracula myth came much later. Dracula in the myth is a fictitious vampire created centuries later by the Victorian novelist Bram Stoker. He wrote his famous novel Dracula after being inspired by the tales of this bloodthirsty prince and other local legends. This is a good example of how sometimes it's hard to cover something. There was really nothing but a few silly um, artist um, recreations of, of these guys, this Vlad Tepes and so on. So it's actually pretty bad TV, but we had to resort to that to cover this. Usually we have great visuals, but that was tough. Vlad the Impaler, important prince. Dracula the Vampire, just a scary fairy tale. Nevertheless, Dracula is big business for local tourism. For many, when in Transylvania, a stop at Braun Castle is considered a must. While people call it Dracula's Castle, it has virtually nothing to do with Vlad the Impaler. But that doesn't stop the tourists from coming, or locals from selling their vampire kitsch. Past the tacky souvenir gauntlet, a cobbled path curls up to the castle entrance. Despite the fanciful legends, Braun is actually a fine example of an authentic medieval fortress dating from the 14th century. I hope that doesn't bother people, but when there's a stupid legend that is based on <laughs> nothing historic, I feel an obligation, a moral obligation as the tour guide to kind of uh, explain, no, that's just a fanciful legend. So um, if that bothers you, let us know in the Q&A comments there. And also remember, if you have a favorite castle, wherever it is in Europe, write it down. I'd love to hear it, and we'll talk about it when we're done with the video. Some of Romania's most memorable fortresses aren't castles at all. They're actually churches. While big towns were well fortified, smaller German villages were vulnerable to invaders. So what did the industrious settlers do? They fortified their churches. Dozens of fortified German churches, mostly built in the 13th and 14th centuries, are scattered across Transylvania. Like other medieval fortresses, they have beefy bastions, mm. stout lookout towers, and narrow slits for archers. Entire communities could take refuge inside, within these wraparound defensive galleries. This fortified church had a room for each family, and when under attack, each family had a defensive responsibility. Stepping inside these churches feels like stepping into medieval Germany. Mm. Decoration was humble. Pews were simple benches. Bible quotes are in German. And to this day, the services are Lutheran. Today, most of Romania's ethnic Germans are gone, having emigrated in the late 19th century or fled to Germany after World War II. Those who remain speak a time-warped German and work hard to keep their unique cultural heritage alive. Okay, now we're going to England. And this castle here, Warwick Castle, is a great example of a moneymaker. It's run by an amusement park company. I mean, the same people that run, uh, you know, kids' fun zones. And they've got Madame Tussauds wax gallery. They've got torture dungeons. They've got, um, you know, uh, medieval armory. Uh, and they've got all sorts of entertainment for the family. So it's expensive to get in. And I think it's, um, it, it's, it's, really important when you do get there to get well organized because there's a lot of fun but you got to know where to be at the right time so you can check it out so right now we're going to be sure to see the archer and we're going to be sure to see that medieval catapult it's really quite amazing just a couple hours outside of london at warwick castle 
Warwick Castle has been turned into a virtual theme park. It's a hit with families, as from dungeon to lookout, the enterprising Earl of Warwick is wringing maximum tourist dollars out of his castle. Along with all the entertainment, there's centuries of history. The man-made defensive map. And look at this mound here. That is the rudiments of a medieval castle. The very, very earliest, simplest castles were called a Mott and Bailey castle. The Mott would be the man-made mound where they could get the high ground, you know. And the Bailey would be like the Boonesboro stockade that goes out from that mound. This castle would have originated that way. And you can still see the remains of the man-made Mott or mound. And you can still see the footprint of the wooden stockade that over time became a stone rampart. So as you travel, remember these castles were born in a humble time a thousand years ago as Mott and Bailey type castles. Mound is where the original Norman castle was built in 1068. Back then, a wooden stockade defined the courtyard in the way the stony walls do now. Hello! You can climb the towers and ramble the ramparts. Today's castle is a 15th century fortified shell surrounding a 19th century noble residence. Inside, the cavernous Great Hall is decorated with 16th century weaponry and dazzling armor. Imagine 500 years ago, the pageantry of a jousting tournament. The elegant state rooms are brought to life by wax figures. We've dropped in on a royal weekend gala, and we're gonna party like it's 1898. The Countess of Warwick, considered the most beautiful woman in Victorian England, greets her guests. The latest hits are played live. There's no other way. And big name aristocrats have dropped in, including a young Winston Churchill. The castle works to bring the Middle Ages back to life. Out at the moat, an archer shows off his mastery of the all-important longbow. Hey! And down by the river, families gather for a demonstration of a catapult-like weapon called a trebuchet, built from 13th century drawings. The crew powers the treadmill, which raises the six-ton counterweight. When triggered, this hurls a boulder 200 yards. Eight hundred years ago, if this machine rolled up to your castle, it was a very bad day. The All right, so that's the big point. I want to remind you: when you get to a fancy castle, you're going to spend twenty bucks or twenty-five bucks to get in. Be sure you notice at the turnstile what's happening when and where. You want to see that trebuchet, the old catapult. You want to see the archer and so on. And you just need to make a plan to be smart. Okay, as I, as I reminded you, if you put into the Q&A section your favorite castle, I'd love to see whose castles are most uh, popular. And we'll talk about that with Gabe after the video. Uh, and I wanna take you to one of my favorite castles anywhere right now. And that's on the White Cliffs of Dover. For 2000 years, England has been defending itself with fortifications right here, looking out across that most amazing anti-tank ditch, the English Channel that protected England from bad guys like Napoleon and Hitler and so on through the ages right up to modern times. The cliffs of Dover overlook the English Channel. Ever since ancient Roman times, those traveling from the continent to Britain set their sights on these famous cliffs. If they were enemies, troops based here fended them off. Today, the crossing between the port of Dover and France is a shipping thoroughfare. Ferries and freighters shuttle passengers and an endless stream of trucks back and forth. It really was like a thoroughfare too. I'll never forget sitting on that bluff and it was just like lanes of traffic going between France and England. And that was on top of all the traffic going underneath in the English Channel Tunnel, which is right about there also. Steady stream, look at that, of trucks and just all that European commerce. And now of course with Brexit, England doesn't have the smooth connection it used to have. France is just 23 miles away. There it is, within sight on a sunny day. Southern England sits upon a foundation of chalk, and there are miles of white cliffs towering above its beaches. 
So that looks, I mean, that's the White Cliffs of Dover, but that looks like the entire south coast of England. Anywhere you go in the south of England, if you dig through that little thin layer of topsoil that you see up there, you're going to hit chalk. And if you go as far south as the coast, you'll find a cliff that is all chalk. The most famous are the White Cliffs of Dover. And Dover, with its bold bluffs and mighty castle, symbolizes the defense of Britain. Sitting atop those cliffs is the impressive Dover Castle. This site was England's primary defensive stronghold from ancient Roman until modern times. For many centuries, English troops were garrisoned within these walls, protecting the coast from any European menace. This Roman lighthouse is a reminder that 2,000 years ago, the Romans landed here and established their colony of Britannia. The Roman fleet was based here in Dover Harbor. To guide their boats safely home, they burned wet wood by day for maximum smoke and dry wood by night for maximum light. Long considered the key to England by potential invaders, Dover Castle provides a quick review of England's defensive military history. Upon an earthen mound, originally part of an Iron Age fortress, is a many-layered complex with remnants from each age. There you go, there's your mott. You can see that man-made mound right there, long before the rest of these fortifications. In the 12th century, the Norman king, Henry II, had this fortress built, making Dover's castle the most secure in his realm. So I was thinking about the, the leader of Haiti that just got assassinated. And I was just thinking, if you are the leader of a country, a very powerful person in a chaotic time or in a chaotic place, you need a drawbridge, you need thick walls, you need a, you need a, a, a whole team of bodyguards, and you're still going to have a tough time sleeping soundly. The King of England slept pretty soundly centuries ago at the top of this keep. With his troops at the ready and walls 20 feet thick, King Henry slept soundly on the top floor. Much later, around 1800 with the threat of Napoleon, Dover's fortifications were beefed up again. With the advent of artillery, the English dug defensive tunnels deep into the chalk. With the outbreak of World War II, more bomb-proof tunnels were dug. Today, visitors enjoy a fascinating tour. As if frozen in time, the rooms give an intimate look at how the British foiled the attempted Nazi invasion. They used an elaborate communication center to coordinate critical decisions with what was, at the time, state-of-the-art equipment. One command center coordinated the defense against German ships. As an island nation, control of the seas around Great Britain for the free movement of both naval and merchant vessels was critical. Another command center defended against the German Air Force. Attacking Nazi aircraft were charted on screens, and Battle of Britain defenses were plotted. Boy, every time I look at that, I think about the, the relatively simple technology of 1940 and how that was relied upon to defend Britain, to save Britain from a Nazi invasion. Oh my goodness. You know, if you're not going to get as far as Dover to see this amazing World War II um, uh, fortification and headquarters, you can see it right in downtown London, a 10 minute walk from Big Ben and a 10 minute walk from Trafalgar Square in the cabinet war rooms. Don't miss the cabinet war rooms. They come with the great Churchill Museum and they come with the underground headquarters that communicated with this underground headquarters back in 1940 as Britain was fighting for its very life. From these tunnels, Winston Churchill and Allied commanders defended a battle zone nicknamed Hellfire Corner. The underground hospital's operating room is a reminder that this strategic bluff was under constant fire. Emerging from the tunnels, visitors gaze toward France. Thankfully, more than 70 years after the war, this bluff oversees not bullets and bombs, but trade and tourism. All right. Hey, well, we've had a few castles. We got uh, quite a few more, so hold on to your castanets. Right now, I want to take just a little break, and I want to introduce you a little more to my food. I've been enjoying some good German beer, and. Um, Yeah, when you're in Germany, I go for the beer, that is for sure. And I've really had a lot of fun and I'm still having a lot of fun eating this plate. This is sort of an appetizer plate and you've got this pumpernickel and pumpernickel 
is a sweet rye bread. As I mentioned, the, the word pumpernickel is the devil's fart. And you put on your pumpernickel, you put the liverwurst and they serve it like an open-faced sandwich. And then you've always got a little bit of mustard. The Germans are really into their mustard. In fact, I don't know a lot of German words, but when we made our Rick Steves German phrase book, we had a whole section on mustard. It's still there. Senf is the word for mustard. It's important. And then you have Seuss. This would be Seuss, sweet. Mm. And you have Scharf. I have over here some Scharf Senf. And you can have Mittel Senf. And then there, oh, there's just oh, there's spicy scent and so on. And we've got that with our pumpernickel and our liverwurst. The liverwurst is liver sausage, usually pig or calves liver with pepper and spices. And as I mentioned, it is a classic thing to have that on your pumpernickel. We've also got our kraut, our sauerkraut. Sauerkraut is basically fermented raw cabbage, fermented or pickled. It can be just like this, just kind of pickled cabbage. Mm, that's good. Or it can be braised. And with my sausage platter, I've got braised sauerkraut right there. Both good. Here we've got spetzla. And spetzla, you'll find this all over Germany and Austria. But spetzla is a chewy egg noodle pasta. The German word for spetzla, excuse me, I can't stop eating it, is little sparrow. I mean, that's what spetzla means, it's the little sparrow. So I don't know, you got to have a few beers in you before that was like a little sparrow. But it's a tasty sparrow, that's for sure. So we got our German style chewy egg pasta. We've got our sauerkraut and we've got our Wurst, our, our sausages. We've got a Bratwurst and that's a pork sausage. We've got a Knockwurst and that would be a pork with garlic that's aged and then smoked and then highly spiced. And we've got Hunerwurst, which is spicy chicken sausage. The cool thing is you get all these different house-made sausages, and it is just a delight. I'm telling you, anywhere you go in Europe, the food is important, and you need to become a chameleon. If you don't eat sauerkraut here, I don't care. When you go to Germany, you eat sauerkraut. If you go to Germany, you drink the beer. If you go to Italy, you drink the wine. If you go to Greece, you drink the ouzo. If you go to England, you drink the tea. Embrace the local way to do things. Hey, I want to remind you that we couldn't do this without our moderators and our team. We got Gabe right now helping out. We got Ben um, answering questions along with Gabe. We've also got Lisa and we've got Julianne standing by. We got a great team that brings Monday Night Travel Your Way every Monday. Next week is our last Monday before we take our summer break. Next week, we're going to Scotland with Cullen Mares, our one of our favorite Scottish tour guides. He's gonna wake up in the middle of the night to be with us. We're gonna celebrate Scotland next week, a week from tonight. And then we're gonna take a break until September, a couple second Monday in September. And we're gonna then go to Spain. So we have a lot of travel coming up after our summer break and one more week until then. I wanna remind you that you can see all of the shows in their entirety. Every show I've shown, every little clip I've shown you is part of a half hour episode. And you can see those episodes along with a hundred other ones at ricksteves.com. Go into the TV section. It's free. There's no commercials, no breaks. Just click and bam, it's all yours. We can make a lot of money charging for commercials. We've got more than a million people on our YouTube list and uh, YouTube would love to put their ads on there, but we like to bring it to you absolutely free, uncovered with ads from any other company except for ours. We'd love to share some ads once in a while, but we are just bringing you our love of Europe. Hey, right now, we're going to take a moment and look at what we call then and now. It's a look at the old TV show when it was standard def and square screen, and then the new TV shows when it's high def and widescreen. You can tell if it's old because it's square with black borders over here, and it's lousy quality, frankly. And then if it goes widescreen, it's more modern. So, and you know, the, the technology changes, but a lot of times the information doesn't. And if I did it in an old version and I have to redo it in a new version, why reinvent the wheel? Here's an example coming up of then and now, looking at me changing over 25 years, but the information staying the same. Thanks for joining us. Join us now as we discover the ins and outs of travels in Europe. The people of the Cinque Terre know the weather by the wind. Bellissima giornata. Una bellissima giornata. It is nice. Yes, but I think that the weather will be changed. 
The weather is changing, I think. Yes, uh, now we come uh, Shiroko from the Egypt. The hot wind. And tomorrow will be the Libecho. They put the storm in Vernazza. From the southwest? From yes, Libya, from the yeah. southwest, yes. And uh, after this storm, uh, the wind changed again. Will be the wind from the mountains, called Tramontana. The wind from the north, called Tramontana. Tramontana. This wind uh, coming down from the north and cleaning the sky will be uh, again Una bellissima giornata. So, if you know the wind in Cinque Terre, you don't need a weatherman. In Cinque Terre, if you know the wind, you don't need a weatherman. Whenever I see my friend in Cinque Terre there, we look at each other and, and I go, when you know the wind, he says, you don't need no weatherman. <laughs>Okay, we are at a beautiful chateau on the Loire Valley, just south of Paris. This is where the kings and the queens hung out and did their royal thing. And it's lined with defensive castles as well as luxury palaces. The Loire Valley, we're going to see a few castles, and palaces, and chateaux from that beautiful corner of France. Because of its strategic location, the fertility of its land and its long and involved history, the Loire Valley is home to a dizzying variety of castles and palaces. The earliest were designed purely for defense. But when a valley address became a must-have for France's royalty in the 16th century, the old medieval towers were replaced by luxurious chateaus. The Loire River's place in French history goes back to the very foundation of the country. As if to proclaim its storied past, the Loire is the last major wild river in France. With no dams, it flows freely to the sea. We'll start with the biggest. Chambord is the granddaddy of the Loire chateaus. Far bigger than your average Loire castle, it has 440 rooms and a fireplace for every day of the year. It's surrounded by Europe's largest enclosed forest. It's a game preserve defined by a 20-mile-long wall and still home to wild deer and boar. Exploring the vast domain by rental bike, you can imagine royal hunting parties chasing their prey. Chambord began as a simple hunting lodge for bored nobles and eventually became a monument to the royal sport and duty of hunting. Of course, when it comes to hunting, good horsemanship is an important life skill. Throughout the region, it's not uncommon to see horses prancing and dancing. Look at that, you got horses prancing and dancing in the backyard of an amazing chateau with 440 rooms and all that history, all that fun. And then you go, that evening we were sleeping at a little chateau and eating like, literally like, like royals. You gotta do your planning, you gotta be well organized. I was there with Steve Smith, my friend who uh, is, uh, we co-authored co co the France Guidebook and it's all right there. If you make a good headquarters in the Loire River Valley, you can visit three gorgeous castles like this every day. And if you know what's going on, you can be there when they got the horsemanship show and the jousting and all that. Starting in 1519, the French King Francis I had this royal retreat built, employing 1,800 workmen for 15 years. Francois Premier was an absolute monarch with the emphasis on absolute. In 32 years of rule, he never once called the Estates General. That's the rudimentary parliament of old regime France into session. This immense hunting palace was another way to show off his power. The architectural plan of the chateau was modeled after an Italian church. It feels designed as a place to worship royalty. This castle, built while the Pope was erecting a new St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, was like a secular rival to the Vatican. Like a cross crowns a great church, the tip top of the tallest tower here is capped with the fleur de lis, symbol of the French monarchy. Each floor of the main structure is the same, four equal arms of a cross branching off of a monumental staircase which leads up to a cupola. Grand opera hunting parties were held under these fine barrel vaulted ceilings. Constructed for Francois Premier, his emblem, the salamander, is everywhere. The hunting theme carries on throughout the palace. This room features paintings and trophies 
from Chambord's illustrious hunting past. Typical of royal chateaus, this palace was rarely used. Back then, any king had to be on the road a lot to effectively exercise his power. That's why he'd have lots of royal palaces, and they sat empty most of the time. Back in the 1600s, Louis XIV spent a fortune renovating this place, and he visited only six times. Touring the lavish apartments of various kings and queens, you notice everything inside was designed to be easily dismantled and moved with the royal entourage. Because French kings moved around a lot, the entire court and its trappings had to be mobile. A royal chateau would sit cold and empty for 11 months out of the year, and then suddenly spring to life when the king came to town. Imagine the royal roadies setting up a kingly room like this, busily hanging tapestries, assembling beds, unfolding chairs, wrestling big trunks with handles just before the arrival of the royal entourage. The French word for furniture, mobile, literally means mobile. The fancy spiral staircase continues to the rooftop terrace, decorated by a pincushion of spires and chimneys. From here, ladies could scan the estate grounds, enjoying the spectacle of their ego-pumping men out hunting. On hunt day, a line of beaters would fan out and work their way inward from the distant walls, flushing wild game to the center. That's where the king and his buddies waited for the kill. It's amazing to think that right there, the ladies of the court would stand on the uh, little balcony there, and they'd watch their men out there, their, 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 their macho men, and all the servants would beat the animals out of the woods into the square, and it would be like shooting ducks in a barrel. That was the sport, the hunting on these uh, royal domains. It's amazing to understand what life was like back then. And you do that when you go to these castles. Next, our challenge was to explain why and how there were so many castles on the Loire Valley, on the Loire River. Check this out. It's really so interesting why the Loire is so central to this slice of French culture and history. For the kill. The Loire River, gliding gently east to west, separating northern from southern France, has come to define this popular tourist region. The value of this river and the valley's prime location in the center of the country just south of Paris have made the Loire a strategic prize for centuries. Hence, all these castles. This river has long been an important boundary in France. Over a thousand years ago, when the Moors invaded Europe from northern Africa, this is as far north as they got. In World War II, when Germany invaded, this marked the border between Nazi and Vichy France. And even today, when people refer to northern and southern France, this river marks the border. Traditional flat-bottomed boats romantically moored along embankments are a reminder of the age before trains and trucks, when it was river traffic that safely and efficiently transported heavy loads of stone and timber. With the prevailing winds sweeping upstream from the Atlantic, barges loaded with construction material for the chateaus raised their sails and headed inland. Then on the way back, boats flowed downstream with the current. This transportation infrastructure was critical for shipping all the necessary stone, and the region's thick forests provided plenty of timber, firewood, and hunting terrain. It's no wonder that castles were built on the Loire in the Middle Ages. Long before the Pleasure Palaces, this strategic valley was dotted with no-nonsense medieval castles. The royal connection with the Loire Valley goes back to the Hundred Years' War, that's about 1350 to 1450. Because of a dynastic dispute, the English had a serious claim to the French throne, and by the early 1400s, they controlled much of France, including Paris. France was at a low ebb, and its kings retreated here to the Loire to rule what remained of their realm. When the threat finally subsided and the kings returned to Paris, many of their Loire castles became lavish country escapes. I remember I'm, I'm leaning out of the, of the shadows. We needed to get light on my face and light on the castle. And Simon, our producer, is, is 
has pulled down a branch and he's holding it out of the way so I can get this one little patch of sun in order to do this cool setting for an on-camera. It's really fun to go to these places and to be able to scramble around and find the best spot for your on-camera. France rebounded and eventually tossed the English back to England. Still, the French kings continued to live in the Loire region for the next two centuries, having grown comfortable with the chateau culture of the region. The climate was mild, hunting was good, dreamy rivers made nice reflections, wealthy friends lived in similar luxury nearby, and the location was close enough to Paris, but still <laughs> far enough away. For France, the 16th century was a kind of cultural golden age. With relative peace and stability, there was no longer a need for fortifications deep within the country. The most famous luxury hunting lodges, masquerading as fortresses, were built during this period. Extravagant chateaus like these didn't come cheap. They were the fancy of the economic elites, insiders who controlled the workings of the French economy. Of course, that all changed with the French Revolution, when the working class rose up, chased the bankers and financiers off their estates, and ransacked many of their palaces. Today, scores of these castles and palaces have been restored and are open to visitors. Modern-day aristocratic chateau owners, struggling with the cost of upkeep, enjoy financial assistance from the government if they open their mansions to the public. And many land-rich but cash-poor no, cash noble families, you can see them. They're selling tickets. So you can come in and give them a little money so they can pay their rent and do the upkeep on that over-the-top home of theirs. Hey, now we're going to go to Finland and we're going to see the Gibraltar of the North. This is the ultimate castle in Northern Europe. And it's in Finland, but it really is a Swedish castle because back then Sweden controlled Finland and the big threat was Russia which was establishing St. Petersburg, which was looking west. So Europe had to gather together and build this Sumonlina fortress. We're taking a boat from Helsinki out to the fortress, just like you can when you go to Finland. A short ferry ride takes us across the harbor to Helsinki's most important site. Sumonlina, an island guarding Helsinki's harbor, served as a strategic fortress for three countries, Sweden, Russia, and then Finland. It's now a popular park with a fascinating story. The fortress was built by the Swedes with French financial support in the mid-1700s to counter Russia's rise to power. Russia's Peter the Great had just built his new capital, St. Petersburg, nearby in the Baltic, and he was eyeing the West. Think of it as European superpower chess. The Russians moved to St. Petersburg. The French countered by moving a Swedish castle here to Helsinki, stopping the Russian offensive, at least for the time being. The fortress was Sweden's military pride and joy. With five miles of walls and hundreds of cannon, it was the second mightiest fort of its kind in Europe, after Gibraltar. Built by more than 10,000 workers, the fort was a huge investment and stimulated lots of innovation. In the 1760s, this was the world's biggest and most modern dry dock. After the construction of this fort, the village of Helsinki became a boom town, supporting this grand Gibraltar of the North. Today, Sumanlina is most appreciated by locals for its scenic strolls. Explore the park. There are ramparts to ramble and cannon to ponder. Cafes nestle in the shade of the walls. You'll find fins on the rocks and families enjoying their humble beach. Fins on the rocks and families enjoying their humble beach. Scandinavians sure go for those beaches, humble or not. Hey, that was pretty impressive up in Scandinavia, but there's more money, more people, and probably more need for castles down in the south. So right now, we're going to head in southern France to the most amazing, actually my favorite, medieval walled fortress city. An entire city that is walled and protected from the Middle Ages, giving us a good look at defenses back in the day when the defenses were better than the offenses. A short drive south from the Dordogne takes us into the region of Languedoc. This region's hard-fought past and independent spirit is evident in its old fortifications, fine art, and in a culture distinct from the rest of France that survives to this day. 
fortress city of Carcassonne is a 13th century world of towers, turrets, and cobblestone alleys. This is Europe's ultimate walled fortress city. While it's packed with tourists midday, it's all yours and evocative as can be, early and late. The city's stern ramparts evoke a time when defenses were stronger than offenses. And the only way to beat a place like this was a starve him out siege. Charlemagne laid siege to this place, and after several frustrating years, he ran out of patience. Yes, look at that. Imagine if you were the attacker and you would think, oh boy, there's no way we're going to get into this place and you just have to starve them out. I want to remind you, this was built and designed for a, in a time before there was artillery, before there was cannons and gunpowder in the weaponry. And uh, the castles were tall and formidable, put on hills. Later on, when the cannon came and artillery, uh, they built the castles not tall and commanding, but, but, but hunkered down and stout, crouching low and uh, ready to absorb the pummeling. You see that a lot in the 1800s and even in the 1900s, World War I castles. So it really was dictated by what kind of offense there was. And in Charlemagne's time, clearly the offenses were not as good as the defenses. While the ramparts seem mighty enough, moats added to the fortified city's defenses. While not really filled with water and alligators, moats were generally just a dangerous no man's land designed to expose attackers. Small square holes on the inner wall once supported timbers, which supported defensive walkways. Modern shops fill buildings that date from Carcassonne's golden age, the 1100s, when troubadours sang ballads of ideal love, chivalry was in vogue, and a pragmatic spirit of tolerance pervaded everything. This became a center of the Cathars, a heretical group of Christians who thrived around here from the 11th through the 13th centuries. They saw life as a battle between good, the spiritual, and bad, the material. To the Cathars, material things were evil and of the devil. As France was working to consolidate its central power, it clamped down on feisty regions like this, especially if they were sympathetic to heretical groups like the Cathars. Look at that beautiful spot for an on-camera right there. I just love finding a place like that. Nice flat light, beautiful depth. It's very simple. I can pop and I can make my point clearly. I just love, I'm mean, hardly waiting to get back to Europe and make some more TV shows. Hey, one word I use over and over is evocative. In fact, we have a bingo game. You can download it on our website in the fun corner. But this is a Rick Steves Europe bingo. And our TV shows have the same uh, sort of repeating things. And if you're paying attention, you can cross them off and cross them off and go, hey, travel bingo. But right up here in the corner, evocative. Uh, I use the word, I love the word evocative. Rick changes his shirt. Rick visits a church. Rick shares a budget trip uh, tip. Rick wears a backpack over one shoulder, a thinly veiled political comment. Uh, Rick says, oh, baby, uh, a silent bearded man appears. That would be the producer, Simon. Uh, some kind of innuendo. Uh, thinly veiled guidebook plug. Rick tries to make a wonky history fun. Uh, alliteration, two or three words, starting with the same letter. Uh, and a dorky joke. Uh, lots of ways so you can play bingo if you'd like to, but right now we're going to go evocative time right here in the mountains uh, between Spain and France. We're looking at what is nicknamed the Maginot Line of the 13th century. The Maginot Line was built uh, uh, in modern times, in the, tw in the 19th, 20th century, uh, to protect France and Germany or to, to defend that line there. And then they had this amazing string of castles way back in the Middle Ages that we can visit We're using Carcassonne as a base. The region is dotted with evocative and remote castle ruins, which provided places of desperate last refuge for Qatars and remind of bloody struggles. When driven out of Carcassonne, many Qatars hid in the nearby castles of Last Tours. Back in Paris, the king wanted to tighten his grip on southern France. In Rome, the Pope needed to make it clear there was only one acceptable form of Christianity, and it was Roman. Both found self-serving reasons to wage a genocidal war against the Cathar people, who never amounted to more than 10% of the local population. After a terrible period of torture and mass burnings, the Cathars were wiped out. In 1321, the last Cathar was burned. 
The Qatars were also called Albigensians, named after this nearby town, Albi. Its massive Roman Catholic cathedral was the final nail in the Qatar coffin. Big and bold, it made the church's zero-tolerance policy towards heretical thinking perfectly clear. The cathedral looks less like a church and more like a fortress on purpose. The interior looks essentially as it did in 1500, and its art comes with a stern message. In the Last Judgment painting, the dead come out of the ground with an accounting of their deeds, both good and bad, printed in ledgers on their chests. The saved look confident and comfortable, and those whose ledgers don't add up look pretty nervous. A wide selection of gruesome punishments awaits the sinners. These graphic scenes were designed to frighten wide-eyed parishioners into conformity with church dictates. Wow. Well, there is art as propaganda. Now, we've seen a bunch of castles. We've seen castles that are hideouts for heretics. We've seen churches that function as castles to, en to enforce conformity. And now we're going to see castles for trade. Europe's main trade route over the Alps went from Munich and uh, Interlock or Innsbruck over Brenner Pass to Venice and Florence. And you can go there today and it's an amazing sweeping highway, but you can actually see the stones of the Roman road 2000 years ago. And as you cross that trade route, you realize if you could put a castle on this trade route, you could bottle up all the trade between Germany and Italy. And that's why these castles are so strategic. The earlier castles are before cannons, standing tall with thin, tall walls. And then a castle we're going to see right at the beginning of this next bit is a 19th century castle built to absorb the artillery. And it is really hunkered down. So let's go south now from Germany over the Alps into northern Italy in the most important trade route in that part of Europe. Heading south, we cross Europe's cultural and geographical divide, driving from the Germanic world over the Alps into the Mediterranean world, Italy. The Brenner Pass has been the easiest way over the Alps since ancient Roman times. 2,000 years ago, Roman legions followed this route, the Via Claudia, as they marched north to conquer much of Europe. Sections of the ancient road are still preserved, Deep grooves are reminders of countless wagon wheels that followed this ferry route. Today, the Brenner Pass is easier than ever to cross as drivers arc gracefully along one of the engineering wonders of Europe. From the top of the Europa Brucke, or Europe's Bridge, it feels like just another freeway. But from the windy old road at the valley floor, it looks like a mighty sculpture. The freeway zips drivers from Innsbruck to the Italian border in about 30 minutes. How about pasta for lunch? While the Autobahn in Germany and Austria is toll-free, the Italian Autostrada has plenty of toll booths. But that's nothing new here. This crossing has long been a gauntlet of toll booths and forts. Empires from Roman... So you'll notice here, this is the first time we've ever used our drone in one of our TV shows. And it's such a delight. We've got this little drone now. And instead of, here we have a, a 19th century castle that we're going to be showing you. We just pulled off and instead of driving up into the hills for a high wide and spending a lot of time looking for it and oftentimes not getting it, we just pull into a parking spot, send our drone straight up and it gets some beautiful shots. So in the next couple of moments, you'll see some great drone shots. And it's just so fun to be working over there with ever uh, evolving technology. I had never gone to this friends and fest castle. I've driven by it for decades. And I'm so glad we stopped here. It's a classic modern castle to illustrate the different strategic castles along this same pass. Times to World War II understood the strategic value of Brenner Pass. This fortress called Franzenfest was built in the 1830s. It was one of the mightiest of its day. A huge investment by the Habsburg Emperor in Vienna, it was designed to protect his empire from invasions from the south. Throughout the Middle Ages, this was the trade route that connected the Germanic world with cities like Venice and Florence. When medieval traders reached this valley, chances are they were stopped, willingly or not, at a castle like this. Reifenstein Castle was built to control trade, but Reifenstein has grown more welcoming with age. While it used to take a battering ram to get these doors open, now 
All it takes is a few euros. Hello. Hey. Hello. Hello. Welcome in Reifenstein. Reifenstein offers one of Europe's most intimate looks at medieval castle life. The actual count and countess of Reifenstein are determined to preserve their historic castle. The castle caretaker shows visitors around on tours several times a day. We're enjoying a private visit. So uh, I just love, as a tour guide, as a travel teacher, as a TV producer and so on, I just love to find these kind of castles. And you visit a lot of castles that really aren't much, but this one is great. And you drive right by it when you drive over the Brenner Pass to get into Northern Italy. I took my group here. We were, I was leading one of our Italy, our, our it was a best of the Alps tour that goes from Italy uh, through Austria to Switzerland and France. It's a great itinerary. And I was guiding this tour just a few years ago. And we, we like to book a private tour of this place. So I called up and the caretaker met us and took us through. I'm so proud to have this in our guidebook. So people on the ball travelers can arrange for a visit on their own. And of course, when we had our TV crew here, I wanted to have a private look at this castle. What we do when we have our TV TV is our camera is put the gear down and we walk with the caretaker through the place and we make a plan a shot list and then we go through and we shoot the place and for me as a guide it was so fun to be able to show uh, take you back in time at the, at the best preserved castle interior I've seen anywhere you got the medieval wallpaper the dungeon the knight's bed boxes you got the sister castle across the way that bottles off the whole valley to all that trade it's just a beautiful experience and uh, you know one thing I love about this castle is what you see right here the wood most castles all castles had wood but most castles today are only stone with holes where the end of the wood went when they were making floors or outhouses or staircases or ramparts. In this castle, Reifenstein, you've still got the wood sticking into those holes in the stone of the castle. Check this out as we tour Reifenstein. While the castle was originally built a thousand years ago, what we see today is about 500 years old. It's a rare opportunity to see an intact medieval castle interior. Within its mighty stone walls, hefty timbers flesh out the staircases and rooms. The woodwork is artful and the engineering ingenious. While there was no well, rainwater was collected into a cistern that functions to this day. Just yesterday, was it yesterday? The day before yesterday, I was in Cape Cod on a little vacation and I, it was muggy and hot and then the rain came down and my umbrella was turned upside down and I was getting shelter in my upside down umbrella and it was capturing rainwater. And it was very impressive how much rainwater was captured just by that upside down umbrella during a rainstorm. And it reminded me, this is how people got their water. They had a cistern like that. What we just saw in this castle was a medieval water system. They didn't have plumbing or anything. They had that right there. And that collect, that was a well and all of the rooftops funneled water right into that central well. And that's what would keep them in water cistern that functions to this day. Paintings adorning the walls feature only one family, the noble German family that has owned the castle for centuries. Here the lord and lady seem proud of what must have been an impressive fortified home in its day. Here's a fun fix for a tipsy lord, too much to drink. A clever funnel guides the key right into the hole. From the looks of the sumptuous green room, medieval life for the nobility was pretty comfortable. The painted walls are original, a rare example of secular art surviving from the Middle Ages. With voluptuous swoops and curls, this scene, frescoed in 1498, is a fantasy of elves, jesters, archers, and fruity symbols of fertility. You can catch a view across the valley to Reifenstein's sister castle. Two castles like these, strategically straddling the valley, could control much of the trade passing between Germany and Italy. To exercise his power and collect those tolls, the castle lord needed a small personal army. This room is the knight's quarters. Up to eight men shared each of these boxes, complete with hay for maximum comfort. Imagine 40 snoring knights packed into one room. 
there was no fire for warmth, as an accident would set the entire place up in flames. So the knights huddled together to stay warm. And every good castle needs a dungeon, used mostly to enforce the payment of debts. The only way in or out was through this hatch. If you couldn't pay your bills, you could spend days down here. No food, only a little water. Oh, boy. That is one dank castle. Ha! I, when, I, when I go to these castles, my challenge, and yours should also be, to imagine life back then. What would it be like to live in that castle, whether you're one of the elites or one of the peons, you know? One thing that's fascinating for me is, today, any of us, the, the most shoestring budget traveler can eat better than the lords and the ladies of the Middle Ages. And I'm thinking about that right now as I'm enjoying my German meal. And it's been provided to us by Altstadt Beer Hall and Brow House in Seattle, uh, Brathaus. And it's just famous for its bratwurst and it's famous for its beautiful beer. And all over the United States, there are hardworking little independent restaurants making sure that they are able to, well, doing their best to survive this COVID time. And I just think as consumers who care about how our communities are going to look when we come out of COVID. It's great to take care of our independent restaurants. So thanks to the Alt House, um, Altstadt Beer Hall and Brat, uh, Brat House. It is just a good example of a chance to go to Germany just down the street. Hey, I want to thank you for tuning in. And I would imagine, Gabe, we've got some questions. Yes, we do, Rick. We have a number of wonderful questions and even more excellent castle recommendations. Um, but before we get to those, can we have a quick word from our sponsor? That's a very good idea. Gabe, thank you so much. And our sponsor today is Rick Steves Europe. And it is you and me and 98 others. There's about 100 of us on our staff. We've been hunkered down here getting through this COVID time. It's no fun to be in a pandemic when you can't travel if you're a travel company. And we've lost two seasons, but we have kept our staff together. We're working hard. We've got a, a, an amazing spree de corps. We're investing in our future and we are planning and eager to get back to Europe as soon as possible. I'm going to be going to Europe in just a, a few weeks. I'm going to take that tour to Mont Blanc. I'm going to hike around most of Mont Blanc. I can hardly wait. And then I'm going to go on a mentoring tour with 20 of our new guides so we can all apprentice together. And I'll be sure that our guides the, that are the, the new guides on our staff has traveled with me so we can give you that Rick Steves experience first class. Our excitement these days is the fact that we have opened up our tour program and we are selling tours like nobody's business. We are just, a, well, we got about 80% of our tour seats sold for 2022. We're not doing tours in 2021. We're doing more than a thousand departures in 2022. And God willing, if we just get our vaccinations and if Europe gets their vaccinations and Europe is really ramping up, Europe's doing good. We need to get our vaccination so we can beat this virus, so we can beat this pandemic, and then we can travel again. As I was looking at all of these castles, I was thinking nearly all of them are part of our tour program. These are the kind of experiences that we weave efficiently and thoughtfully into the itineraries so people who join us on a Rick Steves tour can enjoy maximum travel thrills and experience for every mile, minute, and dollar. So if you want to know more about our tours, there is still lots of seats available, and we've got our staff standing by and we've got a very, very uh, flexible deposit situation this year because of the um, the uh, lack of certainty, frankly, in how travel is going to be in the future. So if you want to book a seat for 2022, but you're not ready to commit yourself totally, like lose money if you change your mind, remember when you make a deposit for a Rick Steves tour, it's totally refundable until the end of this year, until December 31st. So you can uh, grab a seat and then you can just sit on it and make sure you've got a spot next year if you're feeling comfortable and confident. I'm going to be feeling comfortable and confident. I can hardly wait to get over there and the trajectory is promising for all of us. So that's the word from our sponsor today, Gabe. And let's, uh, let's review some of the castles and palaces that people are raving about. Yes. Um, so probably the castle that was most raved about um, is one that I believe you also love. Um, Kristen is just one of the many people that suggested Berg Elf. Berg Eltz, E-L-T-Z. Yes, that is my favorite castle in Germany. It's on the Mosel River, not the Rhine River. The Mosel is the little, little sister of the Rhine that comes into the Rhine at Koblenz. 
And Berg Elt is a trip back in time. You walk through a haunted forest to get there near the town of Kochem, C-O-C-H-E-M. And then you find this mystical castle standing tall. It's actually the home of three noble families. And the Herr Elts, or whatever his name is, uh, Lord Elts, uh, he's actually a man today. It's owned by the Elts family. I got to visit once on the closed day and I met Mr. Elts and he showed me through his castle. He was so proud of it. They put flowers in every room for the tourists. They provide tours and it is a step back in time. So if you're in the area around the Rhine and the Moselle and you want to see the best single interior castle, not a ruined castle, but one that has survived, I think Berg Elts would be the one to go. So I agree with those folks. Um, another one that had a couple mentions that I know uh, Ben behind the scenes will be excited about um, is the Winter Palace in St. Petersburg. Ooh, that is an amazing thing. When I went to St. Petersburg, I, I jumped ship on a Northern European cruise once, and we were doing the whole, all the Northern ports, and the last stop was St. Petersburg in Russia. And then it went all the way back to Copenhagen to finish off. And I just decided, hey, it's too hard to get to Russia. Otherwise, I'm going to just jump ship there. And I extended for four or five days. I love St. Petersburg. And it's just, they've really done an, well, kind of an over the top kind of, um, it feels a little bit like Soviet kitsch in some ways where they have gilded everything. It's just drenched in, in extravagance. And it really is a sumptuous peak at what was the, um, the, the, the luxurious um, elitism of the czars that really brought on the communist revolution. So you got to see the summer palace and you got to see the hermitage also when you're in St. Petersburg. Um, another couple recommendations, both come from Little Sintra just outside of Lisbon. Um, we have Ruth who recommended La Quinta de, Re de Regalera and we have Patrick who recommended the Pena Palace. Okay. Well, the first one, I don't know. I've heard of it and uh, I have not been there and I've heard that people like it. So it's on my list. The other one, the Pina Palace is like the Pelish castle that we just saw, like Mad Ludwig's castle. It's from that same age, the late 1800s. And it was with some sort of star-crossed uh, two-bit ruler, just like Mad King Ludwig and uh, uh, Carol of, uh, of uh, Romania. And uh, they all knew each other and they all had over-the-top um, sort of fanciful dreamscape castles. And then uh, I think I think they all met kind of uh, miserable ends. And uh, this, this uh, two-bit ruler down in Portugal, he had to vacate the place. And the Pita Palace is, is preserved in the way it was when he and his family had to leave. A really cool castle right next to that is the one we use to advertise the program today with our uh, email that we sent to remind people about the event. And it's the uh, Moorish castle of... of uh, uh, Sintra, which is just, you can walk there from the Pina Palace, but that was the medieval version of that 19th century castle. And it is just a wonderland. I'll never forget as a teenager having a picnic up there and rambling those ramparts with a little imagination. I was under attack a thousand years ago in Portugal. Two great castles, palaces, very near Lisbon. Um, another couple castles come from Wales. Um, we have Scott who likes Cardiff Castle. And we have Cassie who likes Carnarvon Castle. Ah, okay. Well, Cardiff is down in the south, and um, Cardiff is, uh, it's in uh, the city of Cardiff was a huge surprise to me. I, I finally went there a few years ago and I just loved it. I wanted to bring the TV crew there right away. But up in the north, you have the biggest concentration of great British or English castles anywhere, and they're in Wales. It's called Edward's Ring of Iron. And King Edward was the conquering English king. And when you go to Wales today, it's natural for the traveler to think, oh, these are Welsh castles. But no, these are English castles built in Wales 800 years ago to keep the indigenous Welsh people down. So these are the castles of the oppressors. And I always like to think of it in terms of contemporary terms. The United States going to Afghanistan, we have a castle at the big Air Force base right out of Kabul, Kabul. Uh, when we were in uh, Baghdad, when we were uh, fighting in Iraq, we had a, a, a castle, basically, and a green zone. And when we had our, our, our base and our green zone and our airstrip, you know, airplanes came in high and they had to 
I understand they had to sort of circle to get down safely and land. You had to have a connection, an umbilical cord in enemy territory. And that's what you have with these castles in Northern Wales, Carnarvon, Conway, and so on. You've got a castle, you've got a stockade or, or a garrison where the town and the people can be that support the castle. And then how do you feed them? You're surrounded by angry locals. You've got to be on the water in the old days, and that's where the English ships would come. And you have a fortified port where England can feed and equip its army and the people that support the army here in the middle of enemy territory. And England had a bunch of those kind of castles in Northern Wales. They must've spent a bloody fortune for this. And it was just brutal um, uh, oppression, frankly, surrounded by indigenous Welsh, and they were there to break their spirit and they eventually did, did, I don't know if they broke their spirit, but they eventually established Wales as part of Great Britain. So understand that context when you visit the amazing castles in Northern Wales. And Rick, I have one more that I think you're going to like. This one comes from Evie, who is eight years old and watching tonight. Um, and Evie's favorite palace is the Doge's Palace in Venice. Whoa, Evie, that is very nice uh, selection. And the Doge's Palace is a palace, not a castle, it's a palace. And it's a good reminder of the definition of castle and palace. A castle is a fortified residence. Now, the Venetians were so strong and powerful on their island that nobody had could, could attack them, so they didn't have to fortify. It was a pretty cool setup. So they got to have a palace. And a palace is a fancy residence, but not necessarily fortified. A castle, on the other hand, is a fortified residence, usually of a big shot, like a king or something like that. I will remind you, a lot of times you take a historic castle, which was a fortified residence, and then in modern times, you, you inhabit that with a luxury palace of some king. Uh, Warwick is like that. We saw Warwick. It's a medieval rampart, but in there is a Victorian age palace where some, you know, fancy nobleman lived and uh, he lived in, in royal splendor. But uh, Evie, thanks for that. I think the Doge's palace is, a, is, it was probably the most, the home of the most powerful person in Europe for many, many generations in Venice. All right, Rick, we're going to move on to some of our other questions. You've actually already answered our first question of the difference between a palace and a castle. Um, and I'd like to follow that up. Um, we had a few people wondering, including Chance, um, have you ever stayed the night in any castles or palaces? Is that something that travelers can do? I've spent many nights in castles and palaces. Um, I've stayed in beautiful, reasonably priced Chateau Hotels on the Loire Valley. Chateau Pre, P-R-E-Y, I think is a, a wonderful one that we have in our guidebook. Uh, we filmed there with Steve Smith. Uh, when I was a kid, I slept in castles every chance I had when I was youth hosteling. There's a great castle on the Rhine River in the town of Bacharach, Berg Stalik, and it is a youth hostel. So you can sleep in an amazing castle with a perch and you can see all the, 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 the boats coming up and down the river. It's just like the old robber baron uh, uh, lords did in the old days from that castle. And today it's filled with youth hostelers. Um, there are plenty of chances to stay in you know, luxury hotels that also inhabit castles. It just depends on your budget and your interests. Um, additionally, Melody was wondering, how easy is it to visit a lot of these castles and is it really pricey or is it fairly reasonably priced? I think it's reasonably priced. I was, I mean, I was just in Boston on my little vacation last week and I was paying as much to go to a simple little house, Paul Revere's house, which, you know, it's cute, but there's no artifacts there. And I was paying as much to see that as you'd pay to see Carnarvon Castle or, 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 or um, the Uffizi Gallery almost, you know? So uh, in Europe, yeah, you pay 10 or 20 bucks to get into these places, uh, but they are filled with artifacts. Europe has artifacts, a lot more artifacts than we're used to when we go sightseeing here in the United States. And the, one of the ways I sort of assess and, and, and judge a place is how many real artifacts do you have? I don't want to go into a rebuilt, you know, old building that has a lot of dioramas and mo models and, 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 and photographs and printing. I want to go to a real 
building with a patina of age with original furnishings and lots of actual artifacts. And that's what you get when you sightsee in Europe. So uh, the castles are not as complicated to see as a lot of the great museums. Um, there are the famous ones, you should have a reservation in advance, any guidebook will explain that. Uh, and then what you need to do when you're looking at castles, whether it's castles on the Rhine River, castles on the Loire Valley, castles in northern Wales, you know, you've got a group of castles in each of those cases. Do your studying and understand which castles are basically repeating each other and which castles are entirely different. Because you'll amaze yourself how many different personalities of castle experiences you can have on the Rhine River or on the Loire Valley. And you want to smartly have a diverse collection of castles rather than a bunch of castles that are just variations on the same theme. And so, I should say, that's, that's what we do with our guidebooks. I mean, that's the big challenge and the fun of our guidebooks is to cobble together, not just the best castles, but the castles that complement each other well. And that's what we try to do with our tours also. So Rick, you've mentioned quite a few German castles tonight. Um, and Ginger was wondering what your thoughts were on the current flooding that we're seeing in Germany. Are, are you familiar mm -hmm. with those areas? Are there any noteworthy sites that have been affected and um you know what do you think this signals for climate change and the effect that it's having uh, on travel thank you for that question and i've been thinking a lot about that with the tragic flooding in germany and basically 200 people have died in germany and when i hear about that i think that's tragic but i think also that half of humanity is living in the developing world on five dollars or less a day and they are taking the blunt, the blunt the brunt of climate change far more than we are in the rich world and they don't have the infrastructure or the wherewithal to to protect themselves or to fix things up or to go to the hospital or whatever so every time there's a, a man-made climate related disaster in the rich world the first thing I think of, it happens all the time in the developing world and it doesn't make headlines. So that's just, sorry, that's just a global perspective and I like to bring that in. When I think about Germany, I think, yeah, this is tragic right now, but it's, it's, it's not a surprise. It's happening uh, in different degrees in many places, in many times. In the last decade, I have found that there's a new thing you do when you buy a nice plate like this with with your bratwurst with your uh, spatzla with your sauerkraut and with a nice big beer you settle down under the uh, chestnut trees with your friends and you're having a nice early dinner and it's been muggy it's getting more intense and suddenly the the heavens just unload and everybody picks up their plate and their beer and they run for cover i've never done that before until the last few years and now i do it routinely several times a year I'm having my dinner, I grab everything and I run for cover with everybody else and you stand under the eaves eating standing up like this. That's the impact on just this slice of the culture. Um, I was, uh, in the last couple of years, I have missed two airplane connections in Frankfurt. Not because I was late, but because the airport was had to close down because of late afternoon violent thunderstorms. When I'm filming, it's, I'm always traveling north of the Alps in July and August. I've never sweated through on my shirts. Now when I'm filming in Germany, I have to wait and I have to go like this so you can't see the sweat coming through my shirts because it's in the 90s and it's really humid. That's a different thing. I've been filming there for 30 years and only in the last couple of years have I had to worry about sweating through because it's 90 degrees every day all August long and it is humid. Now, all these medieval towns, like the ones that are being flooded in the news, they started as little communities on a stream in a ravine. That's where you had to turn your water wells and so on. Well, over time they build up and then they realize, hey, this little stream, we could just pave over it and have a pipe underneath. And then we'd have a nice boulevard connecting the two sides of the town. That's what we saw in the Cinque Terre in the Italian Riviera where the towns that were inundated with flash floods a few years ago. Well, remember the surrounding hillsides are like funnels. And when you get a flash, flash freak torrential rainstorm. That's how rain happens now in generally much more than it ever did before. And then it's more violent and it just washes away topsoil. Well, in the case of a violent where you get as much rain in, in six hours as you do in a whole season, that comes and it inundates the town because of this funnel effect. And then instead of a little stream that's eight inches deep, it's, it's eight or 10 feet deep and it washes bicycles, tables, automobiles, into that ravine, it blocks it up, and then everything just overwhelms the city, and the city is essentially destroyed. 
my favorite town in the Italian Riviera, Bernazza, it was uninhabitable for six months. The army moved in. There was a question if they'd ever even re-inhabit it. Today, when you go to my favorite little town on the Mediterranean coastline, Bernazza, there's no patina of age on any ground floor building or business. It's all been destroyed. And now it is Ikea furniture and new posters on the wall and new bottles of wine because everything was just covered in mud and flushed out to sea. So here we are in the rich world refusing to acknowledge climate change, refusing to pay the price for it, refusing to give up fossil fuels because we can't handle the economic hardship of that. It is the most unethical, unethical, selfish thing, and I'm getting really frustrated by it. As a tour promoter, I'm part of the problem. We're working very hard and I think ethically to mitigate the climate we create when we travel to Europe. We took 30,000 people to Europe in 2019. We gave ourselves a self-imposed carbon tax of a million dollars. We gave $100,000 to 10 different organizations working to help mitigate climate problems in the developing world. And we feel very good about it. We're not gonna be flight shamed out of our travels. We're gonna travel in an ethical way where we pay our way from a carbon point of view. It's mitigation, it's science, it works. Even last year when we had no tours at all, we decided we're so excited about this program, we've paid a half a million dollars to those same organizations so they can keep it going through the pandemic. Next year, every one of those 25,000 people who have signed up on a Rick Steves tour right now for 2022, we are paying $30 per person because that's what it takes when invested smartly to mitigate the carbon they create by flying from the United States to Europe and back. It's nothing heroic. I'm not bragging about it. It's just honest, ethical business. And I wish our government taxed us, but it doesn't. So you just have to rely on businesses to be ethical. And if they're not, we're, we're, we're cooking our own goose. And I mean, cooking our own goose. Uh, we may be able to get through it, but our grandchildren are going to wonder what the hell was going on with rich and comfortable Americans back in the 2020s. There's my rant. And we're seeing it in the news and it's nothing new. I was just on Cape Cod. They got different bugs on Cape Cod now. You know, a lot of people, you know, they can't give up their fossil fuels, but call me back in 10 years when you've got different bugs messing up your life. That's just the, the, the little icing on the cake. South of the border, there's a whole chaotic mess going on with different environments and different insect problems and so on. It's going to be a hellish situation and we could do something about it right now, but we got to get serious about it. Well, thank you very much for that, that perspective, Rick. Um, mm -hmm. Before we go, I'm going to finish with one more lighthearted question. That's a good um, this is while you all will be back for Scotland next week. This is actually my last show before September. And I'm finishing with, I think, one of my favorite questions we've had for you. Um, it comes from Doug. And he's wondering, if you were able to time travel, Rick, and could go on one time travel vacation to Europe, where and when would you go? Oh, wow. I love that question. And it seems like an obvious question, but I've never considered it. If I could time tunnel, when and where would I go? I know it's a, it's a tough one for a yeah. history buff such as yourself. You know, I, I think I might go to, uh, I might go to Renaissance Florence. That would be really cool. I would love that. I, I might, yeah, I think I'd go to Renaissance Florence. Uh, I could, you could also go to the Industrial uh, Revolution time, but that's too much uh, tale of two cities, you know. I, I think I'd be uh, an educated elite in Renaissance Florence 500 years ago. That would be really cool. I'm kind of into that mood because right now I'm working busily on the script for our new art series. And I've just been immersed in the world of the Medici and what it must have been like to be a little prodigy like Leonardo or Michelangelo in the court of the Medici. And then you had all that exposure to all that culture. And then you could help foster that cultural explosion called the Renaissance that helped bring Europe out of the Middle Ages and into the modern world, that humanism, where now it was sort of this scientific 
proud, confident age. It wasn't a repudiation of God, but it was an understanding that the best way to glorify God is not to bow down in church all day long, but it's to recognize the talents that God gives you and then use them with all of your energy and all of your brains <laughs> and all of your heart. And that's what I really felt like was going on in the uh, Florentine Renaissance. And I'd love to be there. Hey, Gabe, thank you so much for uh, moderating this evening. And I want to thank all of you for joining us. I want to remind you that next week, we're going to go to Scotland. And we're going to be joined by one of our good buddies in Scotland, Colin Mayer is an amazing guide. He's going to wake up in the wee hours to be with us. And then we're going to take a break and we're going to come back on September 13th. Write that down. September 13th. That's when we uh, reconvene after a month or so off. And we're going to kick it off with an amazing evening in Spain. And we're going to be joined by Fernando Garcia Barroso, a wonderful guide from Madrid. So thank you for joining us. And I want to right now remind you, you can't make good TV without making mistakes. You can't travel without making mistakes. Let's look at a few bloopers and we will celebrate the fun of getting out there, enjoying life and doing our thing with gusto and laughing at our own mistakes. <laughs> okay. Back when the 13 American, <laughs> this history is so much fun. York feels more, York? In the 1500s, ugh, just south of Naples are some of Italy's most appreciated attractions. All along a breathtaking. <laughs> then, 1687, Queen What's Her Name came. Okay. For those of you who are telepathic, uh, here's a quick joke for you, first of all. <laughs> <laughs> so you're Lutherans with fancy robes. <laughs> uh, you could say that, yes. Thank you. <laughs> I hope you've enjoyed our look at two great cities, Bath and York. I'm Rick Steves. Until next time, keep on traveling. Cheerio. I'm Rick Steves. Until next time, keep on traveling. Cheerio.